seated. Hello, everyone. Warm welcome on this warm day to all of the families, proud parents and siblings and partners, and to our incredibly talented first year students. You are joining the QU Netta School of Medicine, which has fast become a much admired medical school in just a short number of years. In fact, QU Netta will celebrate its 10th year anniversary this fall, which is young compared to many medical schools. In just one decade, QU Netter has quickly become a much sought after destination for future doctors. Approximately 7,400 aspiring physicians applied to QU Netter for the 94 coveted spots in this year's incoming class. 94 out of 7,400, yeah. It almost sounds like winning the lottery, right? But of course, you got here not because of a lucky numbers drawer. You got here because of your talents and because you worked really, really hard for a very long time. We're a young school which has afforded us the degrees of freedom that few institutions have to choose what we want to be. From Dean Phil Bozell to every member of this wonderful medical school faculty and staff, our purpose is to offer the most current, immersive, interdisciplinary medical education to you and to offer you the opportunity and full support to develop into experts, science-driven, compassionate, humane, and caring physicians. The overarching purpose of our university is to prepare graduates for careers of tomorrow and as enlightened global citizens. In today's world, the pathway to becoming an enlightened global citizen isn't obstacle free. And that's true also in the field of medicine where societal forces are constantly challenging how medicine can and should be practiced. I too really believe that you're in the right place to confront critical questions about how to practice medicine in a fair and compassionate manner and to shape your own views on these fundamental matters and how you will embody the Hippocratic Oath. Being young as a school means that nothing is ossified yet. We're ambitious, we're innovative around our unique model of medical education, we're not afraid to challenge long-held traditions and we're nimble in changing what needs to be changed. Our faculty and staff are singularly focused on you. They're here to help you thrive as future physicians and as individuals who will lead lives of significance. And your learning and training will take place in a unique setting. I'm not sure you're aware of the fact that very few universities house all of their health-related schools together under one roof. Here, that's how you'll learn in an environment that fosters interdisciplinary exchange and collaboration among our students from different health fields that, in practice, need to work together. You'll be learning to be future doctors in an environment that reflects how our healthcare system operates today, or frankly, should operate. You'll work and practice alongside future nurses, PAs, imaging techs, OTs, PTs, and so many others. And you'll all share one unique feature of your medical journey. You are being trained together to work as integrated teams delivering the best patient care and advancing healthcare access and equity. You'll also benefit from the many vibrant relationships that QU has with healthcare organizations around the state that offer our students valuable hands-on training and the most current treatment protocols. And in turn, these healthcare systems value greatly the access they have to you. 
you who are some of the brightest future physicians that they will want to attract and lure into their hospitals and clinics once all is said and done. Let me highlight one of those partners, Hartford Healthcare, that recently entered into a landmark strategic partnership with our university, a partnership that will offer a new model of healthcare education. HHC is now providing access to the later treatment protocols, medical and technological advancements, and holistic patient care, while also expanding the specialty clinical rotations available to you. A key feature of our partnership with HHC is the access you will have to their state-of-the-art simulation center, which attracts healthcare professionals and first responders from all around the world. Turning now to this day, today is a special, unforgettable occasion and milestone in your journey to become a doctor. As you'll hear shortly, the White Coast Ceremony dates back long before any of us were around. Neither global wars nor pandemics have stopped the ceremony from being held. The White Coat Ceremony is timeless in celebrating the values that are embedded within each of you that make up the disposition of ideal physicians. You display selfless devotion to the lives of others, even to the point of sacrificing one's own life, as we've seen during COVID. Your ethos of bringing the best scientific evidence into practice, your compassion and human touch to alleviate the most basic of fears around an illness or when families experience the sorrows of lo losing a beloved family member. Our world needs more doctors now than ever with stark shortages in almost every specialty projected in the medical profession. The practice of medicine continues to evolve. It's becoming even more intellectually demanding. Data analytics are transforming the science of medicine and are now integral to preventative care, therapeutics, and the treatment of chronic and serious disease. Knowing how to apply the most current evidence-based scientific therapies and interventions to every group with fairness is a vital ingredient of your QUNET or education. But just as importantly is the human side, knowing how to treat the full person, the physical, cognitive, and emotional ingredients, acknowledging every person's unique life experiences, all are critical determinants of good health and of recovery from even severe illnesses. And we care a lot about good health here at Quinnipiac in the fullest sense of the word. We're developing a wellness ecosystem that will be core to the QU ethos. As we complete our new recreation and wellness center on the Mount Carmel campus, our vision is to make the facility much more than a health clinic or a set of studios for yoga or spin classes. We're creating a comprehensive wellness ecosystem catering to mind, body, and spirit and offering hands-on programming such as learning about nutrition in the demo kitchen or programming that deals with anxiety or depression, develops capacity for mindfulness or helps build lifestyles to reduce the probability of heart disease or diabetes. And I'm sure that some of you will be involved in that health ecosystem in advancing that programming. Individuals thrive across different facets of their lives if they are healthy in mind, in body, and in spirit. The priority we're placing on this new wellness ecosystem reflects our commitment to the total well-being of every member of our Bobcat family. And while I know that your days and nights will be filled with lectures and long hours in the library, exams and rounds, please remember that there is more to life than an anatomy textbook, forgive me faculty. Take in a guest lecture or grab a coffee with a new friend, do a workout or do take a yoga class in our new center or go catch a basketball or ice hockey game up here in the Rocky Top Arena. I can give you a guarantee and I don't give unqualified guarantees very often, a guarantee that your educational journey at Quinnipiac will be transformative, 
not simply because of what you'll learn about the medical field or what you'll learn about the interconnections between medicine and many other related fields like public health, public policy, sociology, psych, business, health, economic and educational inequality, and even the arts. You'll make lifelong friends with the very people that are sitting next to you, with our faculty and our staff. But most importantly, you will be transformed because of what you'll learn about yourself, what's the essence of you, who you want to be, and how you want to have impact on others. In the meantime, while you figure all of that out, let me just say once again, welcome to Quinnipiac, to the Bobcat family, to QU Netter, welcome to our family. And thank you for becoming part of our community and also to all of the families around here. You too are Bobcats. And congratulations on this official launch of your journey towards becoming a physician. Congratulations. Thank you, President Olian. Well, good afternoon. As Dean of the QU Netter School of Medicine, it's my pleasure to once again welcome the class of 2026, their families and loved ones, as well as our QU Netter faculty, staff, and friends, as we celebrate the entrance of our 10th incoming class into the profession of medicine. Let's give this class another big round of applause. Moments such as today's white coat ceremony, in which we elevate humanism as the key value of health care, reminds us of why we're here, who we are, and who we aspire to be. Our school's commitment to fostering humanism in medicine is deeply rooted in the art of our namesake, Dr. Frank H. Netter. His renowned anatomical illustrations were crafted with a striking level of empathy and humanity, and they've inspired multiple generations of healthcare providers, myself among them. Dr. Netter compassionately illustrated disease processes as life challenges faced by individual patients. As his art pays respect to the complexity and uniqueness of each patient, so too does our innovative medical educational curriculum with its emphasis on patient-centered care. This model of care is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. Now our focus on humanistic medicine also challenges us. It challenges us to think more broadly about the health and well-being of patients and communities especially those who are most vulnerable. At QU Netter, we are committed to addressing the social determinants of health and to fostering equitable health care for all communities. The Gold Foundation, which has been instrumental to the development of the White Coat Ceremony, created the acronym CARES, C-A-R-E-S, to describe the key attributes of humanistic healthcare professionals. This includes collaboration and compassion, altruism, respect and resilience, empathy and service. Now to our students. As you put on your white coats for the first time today and each and every day forward, remember to cloak yourselves in these CARES attributes and to embody them in your words and actions with your patients your peers, and the members of the communities in which you live and serve. Thank you. It's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. It's especially fitting that we've invited Dr. Joyce Sackey because her body of work as an academic clinician, educator, and administrative leader exemplifies the attributes of the CARES acronym. Beyond that, Joyce is the embodiment of the verb CARE. 
on both a personal and professional level, she cares deeply about diversifying the healthcare workforce, promoting health equity, and enhancing the health and well being of individuals in local and global communities. A native of Ghana who immigrated to the US, she is a graduate of Dartmouth College and its medical school, and she now serves as a university trustee and medical school advisory board member there. Following medical school, she completed a residency in internal medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School, where she served as chief resident before joining the faculty there. In 2009, which was a very sad day for those of us at Harvard Medical School at the time, she was recruited by Tufts University to serve as the medical school's dean for multicultural affairs and global health. Her leadership role expanded in 2018 with her appointment as Vice Provost and Chief Diversity Officer for all of Tufts University's health science schools. And her tenure has been highlighted by her installation as the inaugural recipient of the Dr. Jane Murphy Gaughan Endowed Professorship at the Tufts University School of Medicine. Please join me in a warm QU welcome for Dr. Joyce Sackey. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Dean Bozell. Well, I'd like to add my warm welcome to the families, friends, supporters, the village that all of you, class of 2026, need in order to succeed in medical school. And please accept my heartfelt congratulations for being the 10th class to undergo this incredible journey of having the white coat installation today. It's really my honor to be here today, and I want to thank Dean Bozell, President, Provost, and the leadership of the medical school for seeing it fit to invite me to be the white coat speaker this year. You know, watching you um, with those very white, white coats in your laps reminds me of my own experience at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth going through the white coat ceremony. Events like this actually make it feel almost like it was only yesterday. And I know you heard the introductions and all that I've accomplished. I started in kindergarten. That's the only way I was able to accomplish all those things. I'm quite young. So I thought I would talk to you on the topic of ACIT. ACIT. A-C-E-I-T. And no, I'm not talking about the pre-med years, which um, in retrospect, I hope they will feel like nightmarish about how you had to focus on getting the grades so that you can get here. You've arrived. You are now in medical school. And you can leave the preoccupation of grades behind. No, I'm talking about a different kind of ACIP. The A in ACE is advocacy. What I had not appreciated when I joined medical school was the fact that I was gonna play a key role as an advocate for my patients and their communities. I wanna share an anecdote. I'm an internist, so I'm filled with anecdotes, so forgive me, I'm gonna, you're gonna hear a few, a few of these today. So many years ago, as a primary care physician at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, I had a patient who had HIV, and this patient struggled with substance use disorder. In fact, unfortunately, as a primary care physician who prides herself in keeping her patients out of the hospital, this particular patient was a challenge. Challenge in the sense that she would miss her appointments, and I would encounter her in the hospital with yet another life-threatening illness pneumonia, community-acquired uh, infections related to her status as somebody with HIV. On one of those occasions when she was admitted, she had a diagnosis of pneumonia. And as the, she wasn't getting better, there was further workup, and it was discovered that she actually had Hodgkin's on top of everything else. 
Now, lymphoma happens to be common in patients with HIV. I was out of town at the time, I was at a conference, so when I came back and saw that she'd been admitted, and I read the notes, I made the assumption that there will be two follow-up appointments, one with me, and the second will be with an oncologist. She had, after all, been diagnosed with lymphoma. But no matter how much I looked through the electronic medical record, I could not find an appointment with the oncologist. So I called the patient at home, asked how she was doing, and said, did anybody give you an appointment with the oncologist? And she said, oh, a team came to see me while I was in the hospital, but I don't believe they gave me an appointment. I ended up calling the uh, oncology team that came to see her and was shocked to hear them say that because of her history of substance use disorder and a track record of not keeping appointments, they didn't think it would be ethical to treat her for her lymphoma because Imagine if you're giving somebody chemotherapy who doesn't keep appointments and may end up being neutropenic, meaning your white count is now suppressed and she may have complications. Well, I'm a lonely primary care physician. I'm not a hematology oncologist, but I knew one thing. I knew that lymphoma is exquisitely responsive to, to chemotherapy. She could literally get a cure and I also knew that it should be up to the patient, not to the doctors, to make a decision as to whether she should go through this treatment or not. So I made a little bit of a sting. I talked up and down the ladder of leadership until I insisted that our patient was seen in the clinic. Guess what? Once they started chemotherapy, she kept every single appointment. Not only that, she showed up with family members, the first time I'd ever seen her with family members. When I saw her in follow-up, I said, gee, what made a difference? It seems like you have family members that I've never met before after all these years of taking care of you. She said, Dr. Saki, I couldn't tell my family that I had HIV, but I could tell them I have cancer. And once I did that, everybody came rallying around me. And that's what she needed. She needed that support in order to go through the care. That taught me a lesson, and that lesson was the one that I shared with my residents who I was teaching at the time, that you may be called upon to advocate, use your voice on behalf of your patients. And when that moment comes, you need to step in there and not be intimidated by the fact that what you're doing is actually taking on a whole department of sub-specialists. Because for me, that patient at that time was the only person that mattered. And it made a difference. A, for advocacy. The advocacy is not only going to be around your patients and the communities, by the way, that they come from. It's going to be advocacy for yourselves. You're going to, as you go through this journey together, you're going to encounter situations where some of your classmates may be having a harder time than others. And it's just a matter of time that you may be in that same situation. So how important is it that you advocate for your classmates? When I was at Harvard Medical School, I was in the role as the advisor in one of the academic societies there. And one day, I had a group of students who came, had made an appointment to come and meet with me. And I assumed that they were there for advising for themselves. But no, they came because they wanted me to know that they are concerned about one of their roommates, that they think the roommate is depressed, and they've tried everything to get the, patient, the roommate to seek care, but they weren't. And so they came to speak to an administrator who could potentially get that student into care. Advocacy for each other, looking out for each other, because guess what? This profession is hard, and it's an incredible privilege at the same time to walk, walk alongside each other. By now, I'm sure you're wondering what the C stands for. It stands for clinical expertise. And the fact is, no matter what you think you're going to end up doing in the future, I've had 
medical students who are in their first year make an appointment and say, Dean Saki, I want to become a dean one day. What do I need to do now in medical school so I can become a dean? Talk about gunners, right? <laughs> Regardless of what your ultimate goals are, do not lose the opportunity to acquire deep clinical expertise. Because at the end of the day, that's what is, is going to make you feel like you've earned that white coat that you're going to be cloaking soon. And that starts on day one. It starts with making sure that the foundational sciences that you're going to be learning in the first and second years, that you get it, get it well. And even though you're not aiming for an A, what you're doing, if you actually imagine yourself learning this, this knowledge so that you can do a better job in your clerkship years and ultimately as a physician, you're gonna have that extra push, that extra motivation to burn that midnight oil as you study. For me, when I got to my clerkship years, I feel like I just finally was reminded that this is why I went into medicine in the first place, that connection with the patient, that advocacy, that making sure that I knew everything there is to know about the patient so that when the team comes around and doing the work rounds the next day, that I was the one that reminded them about all the things that the patient needed. Do not lose sight and do not lose the opportunity to do all you can to deepen your clinical expertise. And guess what? As great as a medical school as QU Netter is, you're gonna find that there may be times when there are things that you're curious about that may not be in the formal curriculum. It may not be something that you're, you feel like you're learning enough of. Don't be afraid to be in the driver's seat as a learner and to raise your hand and ask your faculty, ask your deans and say, you know, it was great that we had this lecture on giving high quality care to transgender people, but I feel like I need to know more because I can bet you that KU Netter is just like any other medical school. They, respond to students. This is why we are all here in academia. And so don't be afraid to speak up in a way that enhances through co-curricular and even extracurricular offerings the knowledge that you feel like you need in order to take care of the kind of patients that you're imagining you'll be providing care for. E. E stands for excellence. And in addition to the clinical excellence that I just described, I want to challenge you to think about a niche that you can focus on, an area that you can excel in, an area that people would know you as the expert, that perhaps you might even contribute to knowledge in that field. For me, it was medical education. I was, I was so overwhelmed with the notion of having a mortgage for student debt that my goal had been, as soon as I'm done with residency, I'm gonna go into private practice, make, make a lot of money, and pay off this debt. And that was my focus. I unexpectedly was invited, as you heard, to become chief resident. And that year literally changed my trajectory. Because as a chief resident, you're like the uber resident that is responsible for basically the education of the residency program. You bring speakers in, you're responsible for doing resident report. I was responsible for getting articles and summarizing them and then just giving the summary to residents. And I loved it. I loved it enough to say, you know what? Student loans can wait. I want to be in academia. And I was fortunate enough to be recruited to then join the faculty at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. As I started to teach and see patients, I was validated that I'd made the right choice because I started to get teaching awards. But I realized that unlike other teaching professions, physicians don't go through formal education training, right? We don't go through certification. You basically, you've probably heard the expression, you see one, you do one, and you teach one. And literally that's how the the field of medicine runs. I started to get curious about what am I doing correctly to enhance learning, and if I didn't get the, re the feedback that I wanted, what do I do to improve that? 
Luckily for me, there was a fellowship in medical education that Dean Bozell has also already mentioned. I applied and six of us, six physicians were selected that year. And that year was transformative. Not only did I learn about theoretical basis of, of teaching and learning, but I also learned about how to develop a curriculum, how to deliver a curriculum, how to do assessment. And it was during that period of time that I met your dean. And the thing that is amazing, just like how I said you should walk along each other, I realized that as an attending, I was missing that cohort feel that I got as a resident, that cohort feel that one gets when you were part of a medical school class and you're sitting in the same auditorium day after day. And that cohort that I encountered as um, if a senior fellow in medical education became my new village, my new community. And we've stayed in touch since then. Dr. Bozell and I, we've consulted each other as we're making decisions about leadership opportunities, although he didn't tell me about this one. <laughs> um, and, and so the message there is, if you find a niche that you want to focus in on, just like anything else, just like you did to get to medical school, you need to study it, right? For me, it took a fellowship. You don't need a fellowship necessarily to establish a niche. And an area that you may decide to, be, to care about might require you to do additional electives or reading the literature about that area deepening your thoughts about, for example, social determinants of health or health equity, if that's something that appeals to you, so that you can establish yourself as an expert. And as I said, hopefully you can then take advantage of your learning to contribute fresh knowledge to that. And that requires publishing. Yes, I know this is your first day, practically your first day of medical school, but not too late to be thinking about publishing so you can contribute to the, to the profession. Now, I want to share an anecdote, this time not from my practice, but from a medical student. Because I want to make sure that you see how proximal this is to your own experience in the next four years. So at Tufts University School of Medicine, we have a, a, an organization called Multicultural Fellows Council, MFC. And this is a, an open um, meeting of people who care about any dimension of diversity. It's, it could be gender, race, ethnicity, it could be learning ability, it could be the whole range of, of diversity. And at the beginning of our monthly meetings, we have what we call Spotlight Presenter, a student who will present for 15 minutes on a topic of interest. One day, a student raised their hand to be a Spotlight Presenter. And typically, we would ask them to sort of put their PowerPoint slides together and share them so that we can review them quickly before uh, they present. This particular student submitted slides that was clear it wasn't going to be, 15 minutes wasn't going to be enough. And yet, the topic was important enough that we decided that we we're going to have a whole new session, our hour long session for this student to do the presentation. She had decided, you see, to talk about race based medicine. And she had picked as an example EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate, which you're probably going to be hearing about. And the thing that she was curious about was why is it that a, an equation that is intended to measure a physiologic process, renal function, why is it that it has a race factor? Why does, why does it have to have a race factor? It turned out that she had done deep research done a lot of reading, and decided she wanted to share the knowledge. Her presentation was to an audience that not only included students, which is typically the audience, but it turns out because we made this a special lecture, the whole division of nephrology at our medical center next door had gotten wind of it, so they all showed up. So imagine a medical student, you being a medical student, and in the audience are nephrologists, seasoned nephrologists, <laughs> in the audience, and this student delivered her lecture impeccably. As a result of this, the conversation about race-based medicine really was accelerated. And I'm pleased to tell you that as a result of a lot of students were coming alongside this particular student, the medical school made a decision last year to not teach 
about the EGFR with the race factor. Now, it turns out that nationally there's a movement that is asking the same question. So we now are perched to actually have a different equation to measure renal function. Here's an example of a student who applied themselves and as a result actually literally transformed the curriculum that was being taught to her fellow classmates and students to come. Finally, this brings me to the IT in ACIT. And no, I'm not gonna be giving you a lecture on how to embrace technology. I'm sure you're more savvy than I am with all the dimensions of technology, including social media, which I use reluctantly just to follow my children. That's the only way I can figure out what they are doing and seeing pictures. No, the IT here stands for Integrity and Trust Builder. You see, you are entering a profession, a noble profession, that nonetheless has broken trust with a number of communities. Take, for example, communities of color, especially in the pandemic. I'm sure you saw the disproportionate death rates among black and brown people during the pandemic. I'm sure you, you heard about, read about, or even maybe helped to address the relative reluctance, the vaccine hesitancy that for good reason, as um, Dr. Fauci would say, for good reason, there were communities that really thought there was a history of broken trust and didn't feel comfortable embracing a vaccine that have seemingly had been developed over months. Consider yourself a bridge builder to these communities that have been disenfranchised. Consider yourself as a trust builder by your actions, by your own being true to yourself and being, having your integrity be important. See, the white coat that you're holding in your lap, when it gets soiled, you can take it to the laundry and it would get clean again. Your integrity, on the other hand, is very difficult to rebuild when you've broken it. And trust is the same way. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So guard it like it's a fragile, fragile aspect of your profession, of your uh, role as physicians. Your integrity and the fact that what you do, your actions should be to help build, not un further undermine trust with our communities and our patients. So ace it and do not preoccupy yourself with grades, but if you occupy, preoccupy yourself with advocacy, the role as an advocate, clinical expertise, pursuing excellence in a niche that you choose so that you have an area that you could say you're an expert in. And is, if you guard your integrity and consider yourself a, a trust builder, I am confident that the class of 2026 will help us move the needle when it comes to promoting health equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saki. I have chills. And thank you to the Netter uh, faculty, staff for inviting me to speak with you all today. Hello everyone, and hello again class of 2026. We met just a few hours ago. Um, and congratulations to the class of 2026 and your families. As a fourth year student at Netter, I'm honored, really honored to speak with you all today. You all look, or should I say, will look great with your white coats. They're all so bright and clean and neatly folded in your laps. And just like you'll be marinating and evolving in medical school, your coats will marinate too, trust me. Throughout the preclinical and clinical years, I encourage you wear, to wear your white coat with pride because you deserve it. But also realize that it comes with great responsibility. Over the next few minutes, I want to focus on the theme of connectedness to each other, to other classes, to your families, and to your communities. 
I want to share an experience that I had last month during a clinical rotation. I had, I had the opportunity to spend time at the Mexican consulate in Northern California that also houses a health education and resource center for the local community. It's actually pretty cool. Um, it's available in all Mexican consulates throughout the country, in case you didn't know. Um, that day, I arrived right when the consulate opened, wearing my baby white coat, stethoscope in hand. My role was to conduct health screenings for clients waiting to be called to the service window. Um, hence, the program was called Ventanilla de Salud, meaning little health window in Spanish. But that day, as soon as I arrived, there was an older lady sitting in a wheelchair who had unfortunately fallen backward while standing up to have her photo taken and hit her head. The coordinator, who had already called 911 per consulate policy, to look, took a look at me, my little white coat, and asked me to check her out. I was relieved that the paramedics were coming, but I took the opportunity to sit next to her, to ask her some questions in Spanish, check her vitals, and do a physical exam. I was glad that I could reassure her and her family that she was fine in that moment. Then seconds later, three big burly firefighters burst into the small office. They proceed to aggressively interrogate the older woman and the coordinator while another paramedic checked her vitals and mentioned that an ambulance was on the way. They misunderstood her story, thinking that she had passed out and fallen due to poor communication with the patient and her family. They were really rushed and aggressive, um, which made the stress in the room actually palpable. And I wondered, would they treat their own grandmother that way? And while their interaction got the job done, right? I wondered if there was another way to ensure our patient was safe without making her feel uncomfortable and disrespected. I also realized that people in the community view those of us with these white coats as knowledgeable and responsible, even if we're just students, and that we can make a difference and bridge gaps when caring for our patients. So I had a chance afterward to debrief with the coordinator and talk about the possibility of implementing trainings, even with EMS and other health professionals in the local community, right? Now I want to circle back to the importance of staying connected with each other. Another anecdote, kind of out there, but when my dad immigrated to this country from India at age 20 as a grad student, he landed in LAX late at night, right, many years ago. He didn't know anyone in town, this was well before the days of Uber, and he happened to chat with the person sitting next to him who ended up offering a couch to crash on for the night and gave him a ride to student housing in the morning. My dad shared this story with me literally three weeks ago, and I was surprised but grateful that he was safe, hence why I'm here today. Um, so whether you're coming to Netter from California like me or somewhere else, realize that medical school is like moving to a new country with a new culture. And those sitting next to you are the ones who will support you through this journey, and you're gonna need to rely on and trust one another, whether it's spending late nights studying on campus or completing 24-hour shifts together during your surgery rotation. You're gonna grow close to your colleagues, even go to each other's weddings, baby showers, and make friendships that will truly last a lifetime. So I encourage you all to learn and to spend just as much time studying as you do with your classmates and engaging your communities. And don't forget about your friends and family outside of medical school. They love you, they wanna hear about all your adventures because your successes are their successes too. And that's what makes medical school transformative, meaningful, and most importantly, fun. Please have fun. So congratulations again, and please don't hesitate to reach out to the classes above you because your successes are our successes too. So welcome to the Netter family.
Thank you so much for those words, Jan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lubicon Opasek. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Education at QU Netter. And welcome, class of 2026. I've already spent a little time with you this week. It's been great getting to know you. Welcome also parents, family members, and friends, and all who help this talented and dedicated group of students reach this momentous occasion. Class of 2026, you have chosen to enter the medical profession in a pandemic at a time when you are desperately needed and your white coat will be seen as a beacon to those in need. Your decision to don your white coat demonstrates tremendous courage and dedication to serve. The white coat is truly a powerful symbol. It defines us, it unites us, it gives us authority, it makes the promise of duty and expertise, and confers the awesome responsibilities of our profession. The power of the coat is felt both by us and by those who see us wearing it. When you wear it, many will assume that you are already a doctor, perhaps they did with Jan in her story ready to be trusted to serve, to care, and to cure. And while right now your diagnostic and therapeutic acumen is in its infancy, I know that you have arrived at QU Netter not only with the intellectual horsepower to become spectacular doctors, but also with a tremendous capacity for serving, caring, and compassion, much like Jan just, just told us about. You have all the right stuff to become outstanding physicians. Some of you have looked forward to this day with confidence, knowing that you finally look the part that you've been preparing for. Others may feel a little uncomfortable. You may not feel like a doctor yet, more like an actor. You may even feel like an imposter. This is all normal. The coat is your new professional skin. You will grow into it. Each and every one of you belongs here at Netter and in coding you. We affirm our confidence in you and we welcome you to the profession. Today, at this 10th QU Netter White Coat Ceremony, our students will begin a new Netter tradition. They will present themselves to our community to our profession, announcing their entry and with it their commitment to joining the profession and serving our patients and learning from our patients. At this time, I'm delighted to invite the QU Netter class of 2026 to introduce themselves. They will do this by telling us their name and their hometown, and they will then be coded by members of our faculty. So I'd like to call on our first coders, Drs. Eitan Kilchevsky, Dr. Tracy Markey Eidman, and Dr. Robert Brown to come on up. Hi, my name is Aksa Ahmad, and I'm from East Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Enoch Arthur, and I'm from Montclair, New Jersey. Hi, my name is Noam Barr, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. Hi, my name is Zachary Barber, and I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. Hello, 
I'm David Barkfeld from Waterbury, Connecticut. Hello, Ooh. my name is Stacy Bubba and I'm from East Hartford, Connecticut. Erica Blitzky, and I'm from Fairfield, Connecticut. Hi, my name is Cassidy Blakely, and I'm from Denver, Colorado. Hi, my name is Matthew Bosser, and I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hi, my name is Andrew Branzer, and I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, my name is Ryan Brennan, and I'm from North Haven, Connecticut. Hi, my name is Kate Brown, and I'm from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Hello, my name is Nadia Bulyakova, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Nick Carolla, and I'm from Amston, Connecticut. Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Childs, and I'm from Newburyport, Massachusetts. Hello, my name is Lucas Cordova and I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Hello, my name is Megan Cortez and I'm from Delray Beach, Florida. Hi, my name is Jason and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Andrea Achari, and I'm from Miami, Florida. Hi, my name is Paul Farris, and I'm from Scarsdale, New York. Hi, my name is Callie Fellows, and I'm from Fairfield, Connecticut. Hi, my name is Naika Garnier, and I'm from Harlem, New York. My name is Sophia Gibson, and I'm from Springdale, Arkansas.
Hi, my name is Meredith Hake, and I'm from Alpharetta, Georgia. My name is Shannon Hangoto and I'm from Middletown, Delaware. My name is Sana Haroon and I'm from Long Island, New York. Hello, my name is Chelsea Hisiano Kent and I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi, my name is Estelle Hofgartner, and I'm from New York City. I'm Isaiah Holloway, Jr., and I call Montville, Connecticut my hometown. Hello, my name is Hasna Hossein, and I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Hello, my name is Bronte Jenkins, and I'm from San Francisco, California. Hi, my name is Rachel Konefsky, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Hello, my name is Andrew Kem, and I'm from Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Hello, my name is Candace Kent, and I'm from Niagara Falls, Ontario. Hello, my name's Emily Klein, and I'm from Hamilton, New Jersey. Hi, my name is Tatiana Kustov, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Alina Karkarina, and I'm from Key West, Florida. Hi, my name is Rose LaSalle Klein, and I'm coming from Alameda, California. Hi, I'm Sarah Lovett. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hi, I'm Jacob Liff, and I'm from Rochester, New Hampshire. Hi, my name is Derek Leo, and I'm from Framingham, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm uh, Doug McLean, and I'm from Vestal, New York.
Hi, everyone. My name is Faria Majabeen. I'm from Stanford, Connecticut. Hello. My name is Mirwat Majumder, and I'm from New York City. Hi, I'm Alex Malhotra. I'm from Santa Barbara, California. Thank you so much, Dr. Kilchevsky, Dr. Marky Eidman, and Dr. Brown. And at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Guman, Dr. Horam Guman, Dr. Eileen Rosenberg, and Dr. Adam Weinstein. Hello, my name is Alexander Mass, and I'm from Bethany, Connecticut. Hello, my name is Dimitrios Master, and I come from Spokane, Washington. Hi, my name is George Matley. I'm from Staten Island, New York. I'm Alexandra McGuire from Melrose, Massachusetts. Hello, I am Megan McNamara and I am from Huntington Beach, California. Hello, I'm Isabella Mealy. I'm from Reading, Massachusetts. My name is Sasha, and I'm from Huntington, New York. Hi, I'm Grace Mikaitis from Bend, Oregon. Hi, I'm Ashton Moser, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. Hello, my name is Terry Muldoon, and I'm from Lynnhurst, New Jersey. Hello, my name is Vinod Musakani, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. Hello, my name is Kathleen Mulligan, and I'm from Marshfield, Massachusetts. I'm Alexandra Murphy, and I'm from Saratoga, California. Hi, my name's Robert Nardell, and I'm from Avon, Connecticut. What's up, everyone? I'm Devin Nadu, and I'm from Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. Hello, my name is Paulina Nasser Saravia, and I'm from Durango, Durango, Mexico.
My name is Nicole Nishime, and I'm from Lamita, California. Hello, my name is Agustin Ernesto Olivares Felipe, and I'm from Permac Pines, Florida. Hi, my name is Vishal Patel. I'm from South Windsor, Connecticut. Hello, my name is Willem Philibert. I'm from Iowa City, Iowa. Hi, my name is Bryn Rankin, and I'm from York, Maine. Hi, my name is Henry Wren, and I'm from Groton, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Alexandra Rich, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Hi, my name is Lee Rowland, and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Hi, I'm Brendan Rooney. I'm from Wilton, Connecticut. Hello, my name is Chris Iron Runcy, and my hometown is Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Hi, my name is Sarah Samatero, and I'm from Madison, Connecticut. My name is Mary Seibel, and I'm from Stockton in California. Hi, everyone. My name is Noah Shapiro Franklin, and I'm from Woodbridge, Connecticut. Hi, my name is Myra Silva, and I'm from Greenwich, Connecticut. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Sklar and I'm from Denver, Colorado. Hi, I'm John Slevin, I'm from Puyallup, Washington. Hi, I'm Phil Smith from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hi, my name is Calvin Smith, and I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Smith, and I'm from Hanover, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Sophia Smith, and I'm from Brantford, Connecticut.
Hi, my name is Diana Sosa, and I'm from Houston, Texas. Hi, my name is Julia Tamir, and I'm from Boca Raton, Florida. Hi, my name is Christopher Taylor, and I'm from Vacaville, California. Hi everyone, my name is Edison Tenesel and I'm from Riobamba, Ecuador. Hi, my name is Joel Tewksbury and I'm from Presque Isle, Maine. Hi everyone, my name is Isis Torres Nunez and I'm from New London, Connecticut. My name is Julia Tupper, and I'm from Rentham, Massachusetts. Howdy, my name is Mark Andrew Valdez, and I'm from Deltona, Florida. Hi, I'm Rachel Vallejo, and I'm from Glen Allen, Virginia. Hi, my name is Victoria Van Riper, and I'm from Kearney, New Jersey. Hello, everyone. My name is Makiba Walcott, and I am from Georgetown, Guyana, and Brooklyn, New York. Hi, my name is Lucas Webb. I am from Bayfield, Colorado. My name is Alex Wicker, and I'm from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Hello, I'm Khaled Yassin. I'm from Irvine, California. So can the class of 2026 all stand up? And I want to wish you uh, great congratulations. Um, it's my privilege as the Assistant Dean for a Clinical Curriculum to have you um, speak the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine Physician's Pledge. So I will, as I speak, um, speak the Physician's Pledge along with me. So we're all making this pledge together. And any uh, physicians in the audience that uh, would also like to speak the pledge, uh, it's in your program. And uh, please do join in uh, as we go through the Physician's Pledge. All right. So I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease, or disability creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, 
sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will advocate for social, economic, educational, and political changes that ameliorate suffering and contribute to the well-being of my patients and the communities I serve. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give to my teachers, colleagues, and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of health care. I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties even under threat. And I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. Congratulations. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Steve Paik, and I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions. I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Mark Yeckel uh, in the stands who recruited this wonderful class. Uh, I'm very honored to um, be a part of the QU Netter 10th White Coach Ceremony with you. I also clearly remember this day. Uh, it's so vivid in my mind. And I want to make sure all of our new students take a second, reflect, take a mental snapshot of this day and the words that were spoken. Because it's going to be part of who you are and the meaning that's going to drive you through the four years of medical school. As you start classes next week, yes, it's next week, right? The tough road will start. There's gonna be good days, there's gonna be bad days. That's why it's so important to remember the meaning of why you're doing this. And the things that bind us, all of you are from all over the country, from different walks of life. The things that bind us and bring us together with connectedness is our patience. All right? That really brings us together with a common goal and how we ace it in medical school and how we think of each other as our colleagues and our friends um, and partners in this journey. So when you're up late at night studying, uh, dissecting in anatomy, or the day before exam, just take a moment to remember today when you put your white coat on and why you put this white coat on. The more you learn and grow, the better you can provide care. ACID is the best way I could have put it, and that's the principle. And as a community, that's how you accelerate together. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to run fast, you run alone. If you want to run far, you run together. After meeting all of you this week, I truly believe that this class will be running together and running very far. 
So please join me in applause as we support our students in this white coat ceremony, in welcoming our 10th class and the class of 2026 to the QU Netter School of Medicine. Congratulations. That concludes our ceremony. Thank you.